Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today to simulate webinar featuring guest speaker Joseph Blankenship of Forrester, making security operations and leaders more successful. My name is Ben Zilberman, Product Marketing Director at Simulate, and I will be moderating this uh, program today. In this webinar, we will discuss measuring, validating, prioritizing security tasks to improve the resilience of the security posture. Joseph will speak first uh, with Forrester's view of security operations challenges today. Then we'll have a discussion on several related topics, followed by a presentation by Andrew's recipe to rolling out a successful security assurance program. So let's kick it off with introducing our speakers today. Andrew Barnett, Chief Strategy uh, Officer of uh, Simulate, a cybersecurity leader with over 15 years of experience, has built a career combining business, technical, and sales acumen as a Chief Strategy Officer at Simulate. He leads our go-to-market partnerships, technology alliances, and product strategy. Previously, Andrew has, was a senior manager in Deloitte Cyber Risk Services practice, leading IT risk and cybersecurity management consulting services for Fortune 500 clients and building Deloitte's bridge and attack simulation solutions. Bio roles include serving as VP of Business Development at Veradin, now Mendy and Security, and Senior Director of Portfolio Program at Optiv, where he served as a technical advisor for M&A activities and co-developed security strategies at, for the Blackstone Group um, and its investment portfolio. Andrew began his career building networks for companies like McKesson and News Corp and holds his BS in Technical uh, Electrical Engineering from Southern Method Methodist University. Joseph Blankenship, AKA JB, supports security and risk uh, professionals helping clients develop security strategies and make informed decisions to protect against cyber attacks. And this is exactly what we will discuss today. As a research director uh, for security and risk, he leads the analyst team researching security leadership the role of the uh, CISO, the Chief Information Security Officer, Infrastructure and Operations Detection and Response, and Forrester's Zero Trust model, which we will also talk about today. His research focuses on insider threats, prevention, email security, and security operations. So, Joseph, thank you for uh, joining us today. It's an honor to have you with us, and we're, we, as well as our audience, are really excited to hear what do you see and how uh, can we help security operations leaders become more successful? Excellent, thank you for that uh, introduction and thank you for, for having me here uh, today. So everyone, I've, as uh, it's been said, I'm Joseph Blankenship with uh, Forrester Research. A big part of what we do at Forrester obviously is research. Uh, and part of that is going out to talk to security professionals and leaders uh, like yourselves and understanding you know, what their perspective is. Uh, you know, what, is, what, is what are they experiencing? So what I'm gonna do as part of this is I'll share uh, some data from our uh, 2021 uh, security technographic survey that you know, will give you, you know, so, uh, kind of a feel of some of the uh, the struggles that uh, we see from others. And hopefully, uh, that'll be illuminating for some folks. And we'll kind of get into uh, more of the topic area here about how do we you know approach this in a uh, in a different way to be uh, to be more successful. So let's uh, dive in. So the first thing I kind of want to touch on, and I don't think this will come as a surprise to most of you who are uh, on the webinar today, over half the firms that we surveyed last year had some sort of a data breach in the previous 12 months. And matter of fact, the number is higher, I think, uh, this past year than it's ever been before, but with 63% per, uh, of the respondents saying they had a data breach in the last year. And you kind of look at the at the breakdown in the pie chart there, 34% of those were external attacks. This is typically what we think about as security pros, people coming in from the outside and attacking us. And then you also can see uh, internal incidents, things like insider threat, third party incidents, where we maybe hired a contractor or a vendor to manage things on our behalf. And then lastly, lost and stolen assets, uh, where we've lost control of assets that contain sensitive data. Let's focus a little bit, you know, during this talk, though, on the external um, attack vector. 
We also you know, ask our respondents if they had an external uh, attack that resulted in a data breach, how did that happen? And you can see the, the breakdown here in the last uh, you know, several years that I can recall, uh, number one and number three have been here at the top of the, uh, of the list. Vulnerable software, uh, we've pushed software out that had uh, obviously had vulnerabilities and it maybe weren't able to patch uh, you know, in a quick time frame in that software was exploited. Uh, then you look in, at number three, same sort of thing, web applications. Uh, maybe a web application has vulnerabilities in it, and those were exploited by an attacker. And we kind of go down the list of the other you know, typical attack vectors that you see, you know, things like phishing, social engineering. Those are typically used to gather credentials to carry out attacks. And then you've got other stuff like web compromises, um, you know, abusive admin tools, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so thinking, I kind of want to just really circle, though, vulnerabilities uh, in web applications and self-built software and even commercial software uh, as being a leading attack vector and a big part of what we're you know, focused on uh, today. And kind of looking at you know, what type of data are we talking about, it's all the things that we are really concerned about, you know, typically things that are regulatory controlled like PII and PHI, uh, authentication credentials, again, you know, being very much sought after by outside attackers so they can carry out attacks uh, using those authentication credentials. That's why things like zero trust become uh, so important uh, for controlling uh, how an outside attacker could use credentials if they've got them. Uh, then you look, you know, kind of down further, and there's things like intellectual property, right? So these are the, this is the stuff that we're investing in uh, for the future of the company. So it's really important that we protect those types of assets, and those types of assets are currently vulnerable uh, to outsiders uh, getting access, right? And something to take note of, right, is as a result of these. Um, uh, credential compromises, vulnerable software, uh, all the ways that attackers can get in. It takes about 24 days for our SecOps folks to identify a, a data breach in progress. To act, so you basically got an outside attacker on average with 24 days to do whatever they want to do inside the system or inside the, the, the network. You can think about, and this number has come down precipitously since I've been here at Forrester over the last six years. When I started here six years ago, it was over 100 days. So we've improved this quite a bit, but 24 days, I think we could all argue, is still more than enough time for someone to do some real damage uh, with access to uh, the systems. This is one of the things I think we've got to get better at it doing for our SecOps teams. Our SecOps teams have got to be able to recognize these attackers uh, and recognize a, a, a breach in progress and then shut that down. And we've got to continue whittling away at that number so we're uh, below 24. We also ask our security leaders and decision makers, you know, what are your biggest challenges? Like, what are you worried about, uh, and what are you trying to address um, as part of your uh, as part of your uh, of your plan? And overwhelmingly, the last several years, uh, complexity comes up as the top uh, concern. Uh, you can see the breakdown in the chart on the right there. So the way to read that chart is the, uh, the top section where it says zero to 20%, these are folks that are spending between zero and 20% of their overall IT budget on security. And the bottom is what I would say are a little bit more mature security programs where they're spending, or maybe more mature and maybe uh, even more risk averse, uh, where they're spending more than 20% of their overall, overall IT spend on security. So that's how to, how to read that chart and realize it's a bit confusing. But you can kind of see, even when we're spending a lot of money on this, complexity is still a problem. And then you look at number two, and it's a changing and evolving nature of IT threat. Everything that's happening externally. So what we end up with, number one, our own internal complexity, things that we can actually control in, you know, to some degree as an organization, that's presenting a lot of concern for security pros. And then we can kind of combine that with a changing and evolving threat environment uh, that we're constantly having to respond to. You can kind of think about how difficult it is 
um, and I'm sure, I'm hoping anyway, that I'm getting some nodding heads uh, out there in the audience uh, where this is, you know, you're kind of feeling seen uh, with this, right? And then you kind of look at number three on the top in its lack of staff, you know, trying to find, uh, you know, people that, that are, uh, that are you know, really good. And then you know, below that, making people around the stakeholders around the company understand the importance of security. So we also need to illuminate for everybody you know, the importance of what we do in security and what we're the investments that we're making. How do those how are those bearing fruit for us? How are they helping us? And this is, uh, and typically, you, you know, one of the things that we present to our stakeholders as uh, security pros is uh, some sort of a, you know, some sort of a chart about, you know, hey, how are we doing on our, you know, vulnerability patching? Uh, and, you know, typically it's some sort of a graph, it may look like this, right? So this is like looking at uh, CVSS severity you know, over time, how many uh, you know, vulnerabilities are being announced. You can kind of see over the last, uh, what is it, five years, this has exploded uh, as we have more and more you know, software uh, you know, applications being written, being deployed, and some of that software being vulnerable. Then we end up with things like Log4j uh, that end up impacting us. And before that, you know, commercial software like SolarWinds, other big vulnerabilities that really kind of drives this problem. So this is one of the ways that security pros, we kind of look at um, – we we present this back to the uh, uh, to our stakeholders and say, hey, this is how we're you know trying to address all of these things, right? We and you know, probably the stakeholder goes, I don't really understand what that means. But we're trying to manage our patching and our security program by addressing uh, by the criticality of C CVSS scores. And so, what does that do, right? It, what it does is when we end up with this kind of volume and we're only looking at CVSS, we become very ineffective uh, at actually understanding how those vulnerabilities could present risk in our environment. You know, are they actually exploitable? Uh, are they exploitable in our environment? Uh, what would an attacker need to do to exploit that vulnerability? So we don't really have a lot of intelligence when we just look at CVSS about the vulnerability and how an attacker might be able to take advantage of it in our particular environment. And this is a uh, quote from a piece of Forrester research, right? Because if we only focus on CVSS, we don't actually think about the attacker. Remember that stat or that uh, thing about the external threat environment? The threat environment and the attacker is constantly changing. Their, their tactics are, are constantly changing. So if we're only thinking about, hey, we've got this vulnerable software and we're trying as fast as we can to patch that uh, as we go, we're not really thinking about how could the attacker take advantage of it. And so you combine that with the complexity of our systems, it becomes really you know, difficult for us uh, to be effective with our with our patching program and this is sort of the vul current vulnerability risk management process and i've been in security for you know longer than i would care to admit and we still never gotten very good at this uh, we've had you know different types of tools uh <clears throat> that uh, have been you know brought about but still more often than not what i see is most of this is managed via spreadsheets uh pdfs um and and things like uh, you know, like ticketing systems, uh, and we don't get we haven't gotten really good at prioritizing how we're doing our patching, prioritizing where we're putting our controls, uh, and you know, really focusing on the things that are most important, the things that are actually making us vulnerable uh, to the external attacker. So one of the things we, we also do here at Forrester is we advise. We advise clients uh, like yourselves uh, about good security practice. And one of the things that we came up with in the past year or so is this you know, trusted enterprise model. And what we're, what we're talking about here is how do we design good controls? And so one of the ways that we start, is, obviously, is we assess what we have, right? We evaluate. And then we evaluate and then start designing what our controls will look like. Uh, and you can kind of see 
you know, this is linear. I would argue, though, that probably the better piece of this would be to make this continuous because we're continually changing our environment. So not only is the external threat environment changing on us, our internal in environment continues to, uh, to change. We bring on new software. Maybe we go and uh, we're moving things to a, to a new cloud provider. Uh, we are taking down data centers. We're moving things around. It's co we're constantly uh, developing new applications and pushing those to, uh, to live. So we're doing all of these things. So we kind of continually work through all of these pieces here. And what the what is the best way to, to uh, manage uh, the vulnerability state of all of that stuff? Well, it's to continually assess it. And so I wish I had a prize to give out. If anybody could uh, put that put into the chat or the Q and A, um, I actually put put the name of the band here. Ah, ruin my uh, ruin my quiz. But there's a great line in the song "Peace Sells" uh, that talks about if there's a new way, I'll be the first in line. So there is a new new way to do this kind of assessment because what we do now is a lot of what I call one time assessments or point in time assessments. We might do a quarterly vulnerability scan. So we run the scan, or it might be monthly if you're uh, you know really on top of the game. So we run the scan, we get the results, we send it to the IT team. We're hoping, uh, or maybe we have an SLA. All our criticals will be patched within X days, and we think that's awesome. We hand a report to the to the auditor. But what we don't realize is in the X days, if there's actually active exploits for that particular vulnerability, we may already be uh, getting hit by attacks, right? So we're not really focusing on, on that stuff. The other thing we're not really doing is training our SecOps people to look for how that vulnerability could be exploited by doing that kind of point in time stuff. Because even a point in time like pen test uh, means that I've got a pen tester, and maybe we're, we're likely only doing a pen test once a year, right? Where we actually have somebody coming in pen testing against the environment. And you know, typically the scope may be limited just due to cost, right? And so that provides us only a single slice in time when we're continuously changing things in the environment. So if you're continually assessing, if you kind of move to a model where you're doing more continuous control validation, that actually gives you real-time visibility to what is going on in your environment and how an attacker might exploit it. You know, and, and again, just thinking, everything in, internally is dynamic, everything externally is dynamic. You know, put those two things together, it becomes really, really complex. And so it means that we have to continue, continuously understand our vulnerability state. The other thing we've got to understand is in that changing uh, threat environment, how is an attacker going to uh, change their exploit tactics? How, if they're you know, very focused on uh, targeting you know, your enterprise or your organization, how are, how are their tactics going to change? And so as we're kind of evaluating those changes, changes in hacker behavior, attacker behavior, we also have to change our controls uh, to see you know, how can we prevent a piece of software or, a, or an asset from being, from being attacked or being exploited due to any sort of change in technique, uh, as well as new vulnerabilities that are being released and new exploits that are being released. Another thing we've got to do, and, and you know, kind of going to a, a model of doing continuous assessment, is to test the SOC uh, detection and response effectiveness. You know, typically, if you're doing a, uh, maybe if you've got an internal red team, uh, the internal red team is trying to out uh, outmaneuver the blue team. Uh, if you're bringing in an external uh, provider uh, at the same time, maybe the maybe you're trying to test whether or not your SOC or your uh, MSSP or what have you actually can can detect the uh, the pen tester but again these things are are, are time uh, and they're pretty well limited to whatever the set of tool set is for the red team and the tool set is uh, for the external pen testing uh, folks so you're not really thinking of maybe thinking about the broad set of, of, of exploits and tactics that a you know, really determined attacker would bring so another thing that uh, kind of doing this continuously and looking at it from the the point of view of how an attacker would approach your environment continuously. It's a, it's a way of testing the SOC. 
as well. Hey, can we can we can we detect this particular exploit uh, technique? Remember back to the stat that I showed about the 24 days an attacker may be in the environment before they're detected. This is the way to start moving that even further down uh, and getting really good at understanding what attacker techniques look like and specifically how those attacker techniques manifest themselves in your environment. So I'm just going to wrap up here and uh, hand it over to the uh, Simulate team. So no surprise, people are still getting breached. Uh, over 60% of, of the companies that we survey here at Forrester told us they were getting breached. And one of the, and one of the primary ways that they're getting in is vulnerable, vulnerable uh, systems and software. Uh, as I got probably stated you know, quite a few times, the com complexity and kind of the changing you know, nature of the threat environment is two of the things that are really impacting our ability uh, to, to stay up to date. So one of the things we've really got to get you know, really good at is getting a handle on our own environments, having you know, up-to-date continuous visibility into what's going on inside of our environments. And that's one of the things we, we can do if we move to more of a real-time uh, assessment, uh, sort of a modality as, a as, as opposed to you know, point-in-time assessments. Uh, the other thing we can do is kind of really reduce our threat surface by addressing the, the vulnerabilities that are being exploited, not relying on CVSS and saying, hey, we're going to try to patch all these you know, all these criti criticals. Instead, kind of maybe changing our model and saying, what are the vulns that we have that are most likely to be uh, uh, to be targeted, and how can somebody tar and are there active, active exploits for those in, in the uh, in the wild? So if we understand those things, we understand how an attacker could could target us. It helps us to really get better at building controls, and then also building our detection techniques so we can detect those attacks and kick those uh, kick those attackers out, uh, making our security operations more effective. So with that, I'm going to thank you all for your attention and hand it over to the uh, Simulate team. Thanks, Jerry. Thank you, Joseph. Um, this has been really informational, and I hope that uh, the audience uh, here is uh, uh, will agree with me. Um, so, few thoughts, few questions on uh, on uh, your presentation. Um, and your perspective. So the first one would be regarding the vulnerability management programs. You mentioned that uh, vulnerable software is uh, the number one um, way in uh, of attackers, and this is what they're, they're searching and looking for. And we see that in many cases, like the solar winds that you have uh, mentioned and other uh, supply chain attacks. Only this week we've heard of a, a few large ones. So. Um, it feels sometimes as if that uh, vulnerability management is like a whack-a-mole program. And our question is, how do we give um, the IT and the security staff more control? What practices can they put in place um, today that they do not get from existing solutions? What are the, why are, are these existing solutions limited? And what, what can they do in order to make the whole vulnerability um, management or patching program more predictable and obviously have less vulnerabilities to uh, to patch. Yeah, I think you know, kind of the nature of it, uh, Ben, it really is how do we focus on the things that are most important? You know, if we kind of if we consider that every time we run a, a scan, we're going to bring back uh, you know, tons of vulnerabilities and there's a pretty good chance that every consecutive scan is going to bring back uh, duplicate vulnerabilities that we actually sent the IT team previously because maybe they didn't get patched. They were outside the uh, our patching window or, or what have you. Uh, there's nothing that will frustrate a IT team more than sending them the same thing over and over again. Uh, and, get, you know, because basically what you're doing is you're um, – a, you're creating duplicate tickets for the same item, and B, you're making them look bad. Um, I think one of the problems that I have seen historically with uh, with vulnerability scan reports that get you know just kind of passed on is there's no, there's no real urgency in the report. The only urgency in the report is, hey, this is a critical. That means we have an SLA to turn it around and patch it. 
you know, and what does that mean for the IT team, right? They now they've got to go and assess: is this something that's patchable? You know, can we actually do that in the time frame? Do we need to bring this asset down and then back up? Uh, if I actually patch this asset, is the asset going to survive the patching process, um, et cetera, et cetera, right? So, you know, this is not trivial. So, if we give you know those teams a better way of understanding, you know, what it is that we're asking them to do uh, by saying, hey, th this is not only a critical vuln, or it actually could not even be a, uh, it could be a medium. Uh, it could not even be a high or a critical, right? Um, but we're saying, hey, there's there are ac active exploits in the wild for this. This is an externally facing asset. If we don't patch it, uh, there is a X percent chance that we're going to get popped, right? Uh, and th to me, that's one way that, that you know changing the the way that we think about you know patching specifically uh, is important. And kind of like looking at the you know, the question that's here on the screen too, you know, I think the biggest things about vulnerability scanners and pen testing is you're only doing it in, in, the, in a slice of time. Uh, I could run a scan a day uh, and then you know tomorrow there could be a, a team that's you know, pushing something into production, maybe that did or did not go through uh, security testing. Maybe somebody made the decision, you know what, we don't have time for that silly security stuff. What, we got to get this thing into production. We're going to miss our, you know, our quota or something like that. And now all of a sudden we pushed a vulnerable thing out into the space uh, and no one has tested it. So it becomes really brittle in terms of having only that uh, point in time sort of a view. Andrew, anything you'd like to add yeah. to, to that? No, I mean, they're good points for sure. You know, I think even look at the, the overall you know, vulnerability management life cycle, it's, it seems to be the answer is always patch uh, or maybe configuration change, but that's that's really where it stops. And, and you think of that that's all outside the realm of influence of cyber. We're lobbying these, you know, these things over the fence at IT and hoping that they fix, you know, our problems essentially. And you create this us versus them uh, kind of atmosphere in a lot of organizations today. Um, and so you know, we'll, we'll touch on that in my slides. Uh, but there, there is another way, I think, to, to take a look at that for sure. Uh, you know, and, and so it's just, you know, not just creating more and more noise for someone to have to go deal with, but actually trying to come up with a new way to solve the problem. Yes, we should patch. That's good cyber hygiene, right, to, to not have these inherent issues. Um, but we, we should really look, take a look at what, what everything that's within our arsenal, the, all the defensive controls that we've purchased. At the end of the day, a, a vulnerability management program's job is to reduce risk. Uh, and so, you know, that, that there are more answers than just patching. We'll, we'll, we'll touch on that a bit. Okay. Um, another thing, Joseph, that you've just touched upon is um, the, the number one challenge for security operations is the complexity. And the more the network is complex, then the more uh, alerts and, and messages and insights and um, information that are gathering, um, whether automatically or not, from different sources and they're flooded with information and they have so many reports and so many uh, dashboards and analytics and everybody promised advanced analytics so uh, how do they how can they see uh, how, how can they find uh, the needle in the hay what what can we add, what, what will add value to them when they want to look at the security posture as a whole well, I think one of the one of the you know the, the benefits here, right? And, and I think you said it perfectly. You know, we've got all these dashboards. One of the things that let's just say you you put yourself into the into the role of the of the security leader who has to go and report to the board or report to a CEO or report to you know whoever, right? And you know, part of that report is you know, hey, here's you know all the all the things we're doing. We're doing great. Stuff, we stopped all this stuff. The other thing that everyone wants to know as part of that presentation, though, is you know, are we at risk? What is our risk level? Or like right now, right? Let's just think about earlier this week here in the U.S. I'm sorry for giving everyone a U.S. perspective, but it, earlier this week in the U.S., a cryptic note came from the White House from the Biden administration. And it said, "Everybody, buckle up. There's going to be cyber attacks." 
no specificity about what those attacks may manifest as, what they're going to target. It's sort of vaguely mentioned critical infrastructure, well, duh, right? In uh, all this stuff, what is that, what is the the knee jerk reaction of every you know executive in the universe? Hey, uh, security leader, CISO, uh, what does this mean, right? Uh, and what is the CISO going to do? Go pull out their latest vulnerability scan report and said, hey, we're at 80% on critical, so yeah, we're, we're doing all right. Um, or could they give them something that's more valuable that says, you know, hey, based on our last assessment and, you know, kind of the exploit tools that a certain nation may be able to use against this, you know, this is our vulnerability state and this is our ability to, uh, to, uh, uh, detect and and stop anything that targets us, right? Is that a more effective message than, you know, hey, we're pretty good at patching or we're lousy at patching or I could really use a lot more people in my sock. You know, we can actually focus on these things. I think it's a much better message. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know it was great. Everybody go change your password. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and I love the recommendations that come out, right? Implement MFA. I'm like, oh, sure. I'll just, I got my MFA switch right here. Yeah. You know, I'll just turn that on and everything's good, right? We're all set. <laughs> That's right. And uh, Andrew, I think that uh, it really touches upon um, how do we measure risk or what kind of reporting can security professionals um, provide their executives other than we have patched these percentages or uh, we have uh, run a, a number of tests and we feel that we are right, right? That doesn't really tell where the level yeah. of risk is. It, well, exactly. I think you know, what we've certainly found is that a lot of, uh, a lot of leaders have difficulty uh, keeping or, or managing a consistent way to measure and, and create a baseline. So, you know, you think of like that pen test or someone comes in and does a maturity assessment or something. Okay, that's a snapshot in time. Here's where I'm at right now. But how do I dem how do I come back and get real apples to apples on, oh, I, I made a change. We implemented MFA or uh, I bought a new widget and it's, it's supposed to help me detect advanced threats or whatever it might be. How did that impact my baseline? Well, do I need to wait for the next year for that? You, JB, you mentioned the ever-evolving threat landscape. So... There's too many variables at play there for me to really kind of demonstrate the improvements that, that my efforts might be creating if I'm only doing that one once every six months or once a year assessment. And so that yeah, that need for continuous uh, validation or continuous measurement of effectiveness, um, you know, I think helps helps them show like here's where my baseline is today. Make sure I'm not regressing somewhere. Uh, but then also you can bubble that up to, you know, at an executive level, I can now answer those questions. I'm like, hey, this latest threat came out. Are we good? Well, it looks like something we've already tested. So I can say with confidence where I think we are right now. And then if we can go quickly test that and, and then demonstrate with evidence on, on, you know, whether this is something we should worry about or not. I agree. I think testing is uh, very important because it helps the security teams to try to see how they look from the attacker's perspective. And Joseph, you mentioned that as well. Um, the detection and response and, and the frameworks that security staff usually would follow is what, the, you know, the same uh, models that they have uh, uh, studied and that they never had this, um, most of them didn't have the experience of, uh, of an attacker. And when you run, um, or, or because of that, they would always be suspicious. They will always apply a zero trust um, approach uh, in their mindset. That's a zero trust mindset, right? And, but if you do testing, if you do validation, maybe there is some room to leave, uh, maybe it leaves some room for, for some trust. Joseph, what do you think of that? Well, I think the, uh, the 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 approach to do control continuous control validation actually is advantageous for you know uh, zero trust strategy, right? Because one of the things we want to if you, you kind of go back to the early days of zero trust, what did we want to stop? We wanted to stop lateral movement inside of you know traditional networks, mm -hmm. right? The kind of the land and expand that a, an attacker might do, especially if they were able to uh, get someone's uh, like an admin uh, get admin credentials on a uh, on a device, right? And then now they're running amok. So we yeah, kind of initially what we wanted to do is control that ability to do lateral movement. We've evolved that as. Uh, 
as infrastructures themselves have evolved and we've adopted things like cloud and we've you know got capabilities uh, like micro segmentation uh, and getting much more finite uh, with uh, how we can you know how, how we can implement those controls and uh, control permissions uh, to to assets and and to uh, data access and, and and so forth so I, I think the ability to do you know this sort of continuous posture uh, assessment and, and management actually lets us know, a know if our controls are working uh, and B uh, help us design such that if we've got vulnerable uh, equipment or systems, m maybe that uh, we are not able to patch readily or easily. Now we've designed controls to protect those systems. So, uh, and we're continually looking at the environment uh, to make sure that if we make changes, uh, we're not creating vulnerabilities by uh, the change that we've made to the, uh, to the environment. Um, now, when you say leave room for some trust, uh, that actually goes against the uh, the grain of what zero trust is all about. Because what we're really looking at with zero trust, right, is who is this entity or what is this device is trying to connect to our networks or our systems, uh, and is that uh, can we validate that that's the right person uh, at the right time on the right device? Uh, so I would argue that uh, no, it doesn't really leave room to start trusting things um, unnecessarily because you're really kind of boiling it down to can we trust the uh, the identity can we trust the device that they're on uh, and are they doing the right things and so we also want to have visibility to what the the, the device or the the identity is doing inside the environment thank you and one uh, last question here before uh, we hand it over to Andrew um, so can any security team do that that can adapt these uh, smarter or more advanced uh, vulnerability uh, patching or vulnerability management uh, practices and uh, security controls validation because you, you have mentioned that some organizations have a smaller portion of uh, their IT budget dedicated for security, others have above 20, not, a, not everybody has the same uh, resources. Uh, the same amount of resources in terms of uh, skills and in terms of uh, technologies, people and so on. So. Uh, can that apply to any security team anywhere, regardless of its maturity level? Yeah, I think it can apply uh, to anybody regard regardless of maturity level. For one thing, it lets you know where to put your uh, your assets, right? Where do you want to have um, where do you want to have your focus? Uh, and as we were talking before, um, it, it also helps us to assess whether or not what we have in place. Uh, whether or not it works, it actually may you know, give us the the uh, the ammunition uh, that we need to say, "Hey, we just ran this assessment, uh, and we're really, really terrible at this." Uh, if you know we get targeted by a, a uh, determined adversary, uh, you know we're going to be in the news, or we're going to have a uh, we're going to have an event, uh, and so I, I believe that. That actually, so it's one thing to say that as a security leader, right, and say, you know, hey, I don't have a good feeling about this, you know, um, versus, hey, here's real evidence that we've run this assessment, you know, uh, for the last quarter, and we are still very marginal. So we're if we do not invest in security, we do not increase our maturity, we don't go outside and get some help because our internal team isn't sufficient, uh, then our risk of getting popped is pretty high. And I think, um, Andrew, that statement about uh, the evidence um, is uh, leads us directly to your talk, right? You were going to yeah. talk to us about um, fact-based and uh, data-driven uh, security program, right? So do you want to uh, add here or do you want to start uh, Right. No, let's, yeah, let's uh, let's do it. I mean, I certainly think you know, in, in terms of asking the question, can security team do it? Yes. Um, they know so many so many folks are stuck in in the, the firefighting mode, right? There's always the next thing that they're trying to catch up with or or, or go and deal um, with, and, and what that results in oftentimes is you don't feel like you have time to to go talk about strategery, uh, you know, because you're always working on. On, on the next fight or, or recovering from it. And so, uh, you know, what, what hopefully some folks will see here in this presentation is that there is a way that you can start to take on this process without a six-month or 12-month transition plan 
uh, where that requires people to stop focusing on on the immediate. Um, you can you can kind of build iteratively uh, and and start to develop some of the or um, I should say integrate some of these uh, processes into uh, how you do security operations today. So we. You know, if you're not familiar with Simulate, <clears throat> essentially our job overall is we're trying to make security easier. Uh, we're trying to empower security leaders with uh, an ability to really look at their security posture overall and understand where do I have gaps, where am I good, uh, let me validate those things, let me measure in the right way uh, using the latest and greatest attacks, using techniques and, and things that the, the threat adversaries are using, but really giving any security professional the ability to do these things so they can see exactly how their controls would respond, how their SOC might respond, if their processes and policies are developed correctly, uh, and, and would give you the answers to those things. Um, so, you know, not, not surprising probably to most folks on this call, but you know, we're spending millions and millions of dollars on, on security tools every year, we're asking for more. Uh, we don't always, we can't always say exactly what that additional spend is going to do for us, or we think we might know. Uh, but oftentimes, a lot of uh, a lot of decisions, a lot of uh, things around the security program are, are based on assumptions. And so, what Simulate allows you to do via our software is is safely execute malicious behaviors in your production environment, so that you can demonstrate exactly what would happen. Uh, right now, most folks learn the, the, the wrong way, which is when something bad happens. Oops, that tool wasn't configured correctly, or it wasn't deployed in the right place, or uh, there was so much noise going on that we didn't see the, the, the real problems, and we thought it was just another false positive. Uh, there's so many things that have to go right, just even for an alert to show up on someone's screen. And uh, you think of, like, you know, how do you break that down and really start to identify or pinpoint um, you know, if there's an issue, if there's a gap, and that's what Simon like, can help you do. Within the context of, uh, of the, this discussion around vulnerability management, I think, look at how, how it works today. JB, you had a, a slide similar to this one, uh, right, with, uh, with how we manage things. So today, I've, I understand what my environment's made up of, usually from some antiquated CMDB, uh, maybe uh, maybe my my vulnerability management platform is now allowing me to collect that. You see, uh, like Qualys and Tenable coming up with uh, what they're calling CSAM or Cybersecurity Asset Management, uh, basically saying IT hasn't been able to figure this out for 20 years, so we're going to take this on ourselves and try to try to do that. Um, but we'll get, gather some sort of context around where are my crown jewels, where are my assets, plug that into running my scans, uh, and then. When I come back with those results, and you touch on, on the CBSS score, how do I start to prioritize the hundreds of thousands, millions of vulnerabilities that, that get created over time? Um, I, maybe I can sprinkle some threat intel on top of that and say, oh, I know this adversary that's targeting my industry is using this vulnerability. Uh, but even that, in many cases, requires an, an additional product you, you see. Um, stuff like Kenna, uh, Vulcan Cyber, uh, you know, Jetpatch, so all these guys are trying to, try to help with this prioritization effort to get you out of pivot tables uh, and spreadsheets into something somewhat automated. But um, again, it's still kind of all based on do I have the right asset information to begin with and, and do I trust that? But then finally, like we mentioned earlier as well, it all leads to patch. Oh, okay, so I need to put these following patch packages together Maybe Microsoft's got a roll up for me. Uh, let me push that out. What we found when I was at Deloitte is that most companies average a 30 day patch cycle from initial identification of the package that I need to go through testing, push it into their patch management tool to let it matriculate out into the wild. And then, you know, there's always misses. And so, you know, I think we saw like 98% saturation after about a 30 to 60 day time period. Uh, so if you've already got an adversary in your environment and it's been 24 days, you're still waiting for that patch to roll out. If that's your answer to uh, to dealing with these vulnerabilities, right, or the exploits associated with them, uh, so there there has to be a better way. And then you know I have a patch Tuesday thing on here. You're just going to rinse and repeat and start this whole process over again next month. Um, so here's here's what we propose instead, uh, or in addition to, I should say. So. Uh, again, you know, Simulate being this, this platform that you can leverage to uh, essentially 
harness the, the, the latest and greatest attacks, the, the techniques and tactics that adversaries are using out there, run them in a safe way in your environment so you can demonstrate in real time exactly what my EDR might be doing, what my next gen firewall might see, what my email gateway might be able to prevent. Again, all that all that investment that you've been making in security controls and, and seeing are they doing what they should be doing. And the, the idea here is like, again, let's, let's take some control back and how we mitigate these risks presented by vulnerabilities back to the cyber team. Well, it might take 30 to 60 days to get a patch out there, or it may never happen because it's Java and you've got homegrown applications running on a 10 year old system and no one's ever going to be allowed to touch that because it's working and, and you know, IT just can't do anything about it. Uh, so we can put control back in cyber. We can make a firewall rule change very quickly. We can push out a new configuration policy onto our EDR, our DLP solution within a day if we have to, right? Um, so this approach by first, you know, having that baseline that we spoke about from, you know, from the last time we ran it, uh, identifying the TTPs that we want to go and test with, um, you know, and then going into this assessment mode. So while I'm, I am scanning in parallel, I'm also safely executing malicious behavior so I can see exactly how I respond. Uh, I use the term BAU or business as usual. And so what we see many of our clients do is they've got set scenarios. It could be a full kill chain assessment. It could be I'm just going to blast a thousand different variants of ransomware uh, against my EDR to make sure that nothing's regressing. We, we have seen in the past, uh, I won't name names, but certain next gen firewall manufacturers change the severity of a, uh, of a piece of malware. And, you know, for whatever reason it happened, oftentimes companies will block based on severity level. I'm going to block the criticals and highs, but I'm just going to alert on the mediums. Well, if something happens to trickle down into a medium that's still exploitable, that's still out there in the wild, all of a sudden your tool has stopped blocking it. Not by any, any mistake you made, but just kind of that's just what happened. So by, by launching, you know, scheduled, scheduled attacks, uh, lots of different scenarios, lots of different approaches, I can get that confidence that um, my controls are still doing today what they did for me yesterday, what they did for me the week before, and, and it's all automated. It's all running for me. Uh, so that's why I say it empowers the security operations teams. I know that stuff's working the right way, so I can go focus on anything new that's popping up. And then in, include that in how you do prioritization. And so you think of, a, yeah, I get my scan data. I see all my, my, my vulnerabilities out there there's a critical or high level vulnerability that has a known exploit in the wild. Let me take that exploit and then go run it, whether it's a piece of malware uh, and I'm trying to see, can it traverse my perimeter? Can any of my defensive controls on the wire see it, stop it? If it lands on one of my machines, are my defensive controls on the endpoint or on the server working for me? Can my EPP stop it when it gets written to disk? Can my EDR kill it at the point of execution? Let me run those things and understand whether or not this is an exploit that's going to require me to pivot and go address it, wake somebody up in the middle of the night if I have to, or are my mitigating controls working correctly? Um, if yes, great. Certainly we'll let IT know, hey, by the way, we've got these vulnerable systems, they need to get patched, but I'm good for now because I've just tested this and I know that my controls are working for me. And so it, it kind of reduces some of the stress gives everyone more confidence to really address those risks. Um, and if it, you know, I think Ben, are we, we're going to get questions in through the, the chat at the end. Yeah. So happy to talk more about this when we, when we get to uh, the question section. Um, from a, from a more of a leadership perspective, if you think about the challenges that we've got there, like we're, we're very, it's still a very technical kind of role here, even as a CISO and, um, you know, we're getting questions asked from the board. Like they see, they see that that announcement from the White House. What does this mean for us? Well, how are we going to get attacked? What are they, What are they going to do? Uh, can we stop that latest threat? Uh, you, you know, we, we we keep piling more and more money into uh, the cyber budget. Like that that greater than twenty percent thing, JB. That that blew my mind. I, I I didn't realize that people are now above that threshold. I thought you you're lucky if you get five percent of what you spend. Um, but you know how how are we spending these dollars effectively? Can I demonstrate ROI? It's a lot of things that um, you know I've seen at a very high level, but 
um, at the same time require real data evidence to plug in and then bubble that up um, to answering, you know, sometimes where it's a simple question, but it can be very complex. Uh, you, you certainly don't want to show up at the board and talk about, oh, well, we've remediated, you know, 60% of the 5 million vulnerabilities that are out there. That's just, there's no context. Someone who's not cyber isn't going to understand a lick of that. And so, you know, let me let me talk about things in a different way. Uh, use Using Simulate to give leaders the, the confidence to say, like, yep, I know what's going on in the background, but here's what this means to us. You know, we've tested against this threat adversary. We know what they use. And... You know, something new might come up, but we're prepared. And it's just giving giving leadership that are not in cyber the, the assurance that you know what you're doing. And then conversely, from the bottom up level, you think of like, I've got all this data. I've got, you know, thousands and thousands of events per second rolling into my sim. Uh, hopefully I'm getting the right data from my controls. I'm getting the accepts and the denies from my firewalls. I'm getting all the telemetry data from my endpoint controls to try to identify the right things. Ben, you mentioned the uh, the needle in the haystack, right? Like the, that SOC analyst role is tough. You got to find those things as quickly as possible. You got to be able to, to um, you know, kind of discard the false positives as quickly as possible. How do we get better at doing those things uh, if we're always in that firefighting mode? And um, with, with, with Simulate, what this enables you to do really is like, we are the needle. We are that bad thing that you're looking for. If you know how it's run, you know how it behaves in your environment, you can then start to tune and improve your processes, improve your content in your SIM or your other alerting tools um, so that you know what's, you know, you have more confidence in what's real and, and what might not necessarily need to be investigated. And so we bring this stuff together and this allows the whole security program, the folks, you know, whether the, the, they're the first responders on the, on the uh, you know, in the SOC to triage or bubbling that up to the executive leadership that's trying to get more buy-in uh, or support, you know, we, we can create this cohesive uh, environment where folks are able to share the information that matters um, and you're able to, to achieve a lot of the goals that you want out of your security program. So how does Simulate do all of this stuff? So... We, um, you know, like I said, we're, we're, we're a security platform that allows you to run these, these attacks in, in a safe way. It's SaaS-based. Uh, what you can do is essentially, you know, depending on the use case that we're looking at, uh, you may or may not need an agent deployed in your environment. And I say that because if I want to take a look at, say, my attack surface from an external perspective, we can scan that. We can go and do all the cool things that you see out of, say, a showdown or something like that, but then dive in deeper. Let's go and, and interrogate all the systems that we find off of a domain. What, what are we seeing from the subdomain perspective? Are we seeing um, you know, squatting and squatter accounts that look like your domain, but maybe there's a, a character change? Um, are we seeing other folks registering stuff uh, that, that you may not be aware of in different geographies? Uh, and then traversing the perimeter going internal, uh, you can take a simulated agent, drop it on a host, drop it in a, in a, in a different environment, and then test end to end. What are my controls doing for me? Can I deliver that payload across my perimeter uh, into the cloud, into my data center, into a, a smaller home office even? Um, so, you know, leveraging our technology to really go and look at all of the techniques across the kill chain um, to understand exactly what my security controls are doing for me. And feeding that data into a security operations center. So we, we integrate with our defensive controls. So we're talking about, I want to understand if my content in Splunk uh, or in Sentinel is working correctly. Do I get an alert when a payload lands on a host? Do I get an alert if some, I see someone uh, harvesting credentials and trying to move laterally through my environment? I can answer those questions as well. Uh, again, all for the purpose of helping someone improve their security program. So, you know, we've talked a lot about these key elements today. Um, and, and so this is really, a, we're, we're trying to create this platform that enables, um, you know, folks throughout the security organization to work together and collaborate. Uh, just like we have that kind of almost adversarial situation in many organizations today between cyber and IT, even within cyber, you can have these issues where you've got a red team who's focused on trying to uh, simulate adversaries, trying to run campaigns and see what can, can't be done today 
that's not always, uh, you know, it's, it's not always done in a collaborative way with the blue team, with the folks whose job is to, to build out the screen infrastructure, operate it, make sure that you're doing what you can. And so, you know, giving someone a platform where both teams can operate and say, hey, we ran these things. Here's what our tools did. Cool. Let's work together to improve. Let's work together to fix that gap uh, or make a tweak in the tune and run it again. Um, so by kind of giving everybody the, the same platform, the same way, the same language, uh, what we're seeing in many of our clients is that, that when they have a red team and, and a blue team, that they're now able to really work together to, to, to fix problems. And so finally, you know, what we call, what we define as the extended security posture management um, what Simulate drives overall is that that cohesiveness. Um, you know whether you're you're going through some sort of digital transformation process today, where you're putting more and more workloads up in the cloud. Are my defensive controls up there working the same way that they worked for me in my data center? Can I confidently say that my security posture across the hybrid cloud environment is where I need it to be? Uh, you know, oftentimes we're, uh, <laughs> folks in cyber are kind of behind the eight ball when it comes to that because uh, the businesses are moving things into different SaaS platforms, moving into different cloud environments without really letting anyone know because it's easy. Um, but, you know, I think you know, I'm probably preaching to the choir there uh, with this audience. But, yeah, I mean, like giving you an ability to at scale um, automate the same thing so I get an apple, apples to apples comparison across my different environments is, is what Simulate's capabilities are all about. Um, so really, depending on, it doesn't really matter where you are, can uh, a less mature cybersecurity team develop these or you know, leverage this stuff? Absolutely. Uh, you know, even if I don't have all of the, the cool gadgets out there that a well-funded, um, super large environment or, or company has, um, you know, what we find is that almost all the time, security technologies can do exactly what they say they can do if they're configured in the right way. And uh, by, by safely running these different types of behaviors, we're able to demonstrate uh, exactly what needs to get changed, um, if, if anything. Uh, in order to, to really get the most value, get the most effectiveness out of your security controls. And then as you move forward, as you start to progress in, in maturity, you can go from just real tool testing and tuning into that next thing. Let's start to run campaigns. We think that APT42 is targeting our environment. What do they use? Well, let's go run those things. We've got that content in Simulate. Um, let's go. Let's go see what it would look like if, uh, if a certain foreign actor were to, to try to use the, the things that had been observed out in the wild uh, and target our organization. And then finally, moving that up into um, you know translating that into total overall risk. If, um, if there are any fair methodology people on the call, uh, you know what I'm talking about when you're trying to get to a uh, residual risk calculation. Oftentimes, that's very fluffy. Uh, how do I determine the numbers that I put into those things? We can help with that. Uh, we can demonstrate exactly what your controls are doing for you against your inherent risk and get you to uh, more having more confidence in what those scores look like. So that's it. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah. Uh, we are getting to the bottom of the hour, so um, I would uh, like to say that I really enjoyed our conversation today, and I think it was very, very powerful and a lot of value to our audience. Um, Joseph, any closing statement? Wow, closing statements. Um, you know, and, uh, Andrew, I, I couldn't help but, uh, but laugh when you uh, had the slide that said, uh, repeat next patch Tuesday. I thought that was... <clears throat> that was absolutely hilarious. Uh, I think one of the things to kind of even add to that, right? So it is true. We will absolutely repeat it every patch Tuesday. And then we'll intersperse it with uh, crazy things like uh, Log4j that come raining in at the end of the year where people are trying to gear up for holidays uh, or trying to close out their, uh, their their year or their quarter and makes the security team just absolutely miserable, right? So we understand we've got the vulnerable systems uh, and we want to be able to send people home uh, to enjoy their holiday. 
So uh, you know, how do we prioritize which systems to go after, right? Where do we tell, or if we've got our IR team on standby, because there's IR teams all over the world that were sit sitting around, uh, you, know, sit, you know, waiting to see how they were going to be impacted, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, trying to help. Uh, so being able to focus those efforts better, I think would have uh, maybe have gotten people home earlier um, at the end of the year, perhaps. Yep. I agree. Thank you very much. Uh, it was great having you with us today, Joseph. Um, thanks everyone who has taken the time uh, to be listening in. Uh, you would like you to know that this uh, talk, this conversation is going to be available on demand as well. So if you liked it, you can share it with your peers. I invite you to follow uh, Simulated Forester over at the social networks and hear more such content um, soon. And thanks everybody. Stay safe and have a great day. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Joseph. Thanks, man. Thanks, Jamie. Thank you.